country. And I think everyone should see this as, you know, our challenges right now and our concerns are really opportunities for us to know how we can improve upon this and keep moving forward. And I think that's, you know, we, we've got to remain positive and um, just optimistic about what, what's coming and what the future of North Carolina is. Today is Sunday, April 5th, and we are joined today by Senator Deanna Ballard, who represents the 45th District in the North Carolina Senate. Uh, Senator, thanks for joining us. And, and I guess you could uh, start by maybe letting us know uh, just how the Senate has played a role in some of the um, uh, gathering of resources, just connecting of people and listening to stories here as you and your constituents uh, deal with the crisis at hand. Sure. Uh, thanks for taking time to, to talk today and giving me an opportunity really to kind of share maybe a little bit of information. But um, in the Senate, we have been actively really engaging with our constituents and trying to be as responsive um, and as helpful in providing as much accurate information as we can, as well as just the resources for the information and the accessibility to it. Um, and I think that's really key in serving um, our communities right now and those individuals, those businesses and those families knowing um, where to, who to call and where to go. Uh, so I would say like each Senate member in the Senate has been very engaged on a local level in their districts. Um, across the state as a whole, I would give you kind of a day of, um, we, are, we, we basically are in conference calls regularly with uh, HHS and, and Mandy Cohen, our Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, receiving kind of those daily updates on where things are and what our what our hospitals capacities look like, um, our PPE uh, equipment, you know, uh, whether we have shortages or whether we're at capacity or how much more we need or you know anything like that. Uh, so there's a lot of information uh, that we're just getting and that's developing every day, just like um, folks in the local governments and towns are seeing too. Uh, I deal a lot, you know, I serve as chair of education in the Senate, so I serve as chair of education oversight, so we've actually been tasked with kind of really pulling together um, and working collaborative, collaboratively with our Democrat counterparts in, you know, what, what challenges and what concerns are our school districts facing um, and how can we work together to, you know, ensure that those needs are met. Um, during this time. So there's a lot of like information gathering that's taking place right now, a lot of a lot of just listening, but then yet being responsive and actively engaging in those communities and with those folks boots on the ground, essentially. You know, you mentioned schools and, and we have seen here in Watauga County uh, almost a complete revisioning of what a school system looks like in a very short period of time and taking that information online. Uh, as you work with superintendents all over the state, um, what does it say about their resilience and, and their creativity in finding ways to get classroom lessons brought to the to the dens and living rooms of communities all over the state of North Carolina? Oh, across the state, I mean, everybody I really believe um, at the district level has continued to step up. I have constantly um, tried to encourage and just really applaud the innovation that's taken place at the local level. Uh, teachers have had to pivot on a dime and literally like uh, have their hands full with really trying to you know change the way that they handle instruction for those students and how to reach those students. Um, as we all know, our state really experiences some digital divide. So there's not districts that maybe have as many, um, as much of a, a broadband or Wi-Fi infrastructure as other districts. So, um, so each district's different. Uh, teachers have actually, I've seen teachers that have gone by the house and stood outside and have even maybe handled lessons plans like through the windows or, you know, have have printed materials and packets of information for those to be delivered with meals on school buses as um, they deliver, you know, to those communities when if they don't have access um, to either a device to get the uh, instruction or their assignment or, you know, the connectivity to do that. But each district has really um, been resilient and and remaining positive, and I think that's important for the just the, the health and the well-being of each student. And I think at the end of the day, we want to take care of those students primarily, and most importantly, and really ensure that they feel uh, feel safe no matter what. You know, at the end of the day, with so much uncertainty really around us all, in in all sectors, um, I think that's really uh, just a, a, a key um, a key value, even to me, but also I mean, just to so many that I interact with every day. 
you, know, you mentioned uncertainty, and that certainly has crept into the business world in, in quite a, an enormous way here, and not only in North Carolina, but around the globe. Uh, you look at unemployment, uh, and, and that being a, a key discussion point for a lot of businesses and individuals to, uh, to undertake at this point in time, figuring out um, exactly how the process is working, where federal money is entering into the picture, uh, and, and also dealing with the fact that North Carolina, like many states, has had a, an exponential increase in volume of needing those services. So how do you feel like the state has responded uh, to that challenge, and, and what are some other things that are, are, are in the works to make sure that the, uh, the employment insurance uh, situation here in this state is as robust as it can be when people need it the most? Understood. I mean, we're hearing from constituents every day, if not every other hour on this issue, asking for help and assistance on how to connect, how to get through. I've been online waiting to fill out this application. Um, we've talked, we sent, there were a group of us legislators that actually sent a letter to, to uh, Secretary Copeland um, over at Commerce, who runs uh, the, the Employment Services Department and Division, uh, really imploring upon him um, to take some more aggressive steps. And so last week that, that really took shape. I mean, there were some concrete steps to help move this forward. Um, I think in the best interest of those that are clearly stepping up and, and taking the time to apply, but you know, they've added 350 temporary employees. They've extended their hours to 8 p.m. They've increased server capacity, which should help the website issue um, as well. So there's a lot of things I think that they're, they're doing. It's just, I don't think anyone was really, um, everything moves so quickly from the governor's order um, down through the agency that the, no one had time to really prepare for the surge that took place. So, you know, I'm just trying to encourage people. Um, I really do. I mean, I, I try to encourage them just to keep at it. I actually follow up with them or um, actually try to get someone on the phone to really talk them through it and until they can kind of get it taken care of. But um, with the federal dollars coming down and that, that package happening at the same time also kind of complement, complements or complicates things um, at the same time. So it makes, it just adds another burden. Um, but also, I mean, it's helpful to know that we can partner with the feds on this particular issue during this, this, this critical time too. So I think folks, especially, I think on Friday, um, they announced that, you know, as a, under, under the CARES Act, the self-employed uh, citizens who lost their income can apply for unemployment. So once the systems get aligned, which should probably happen within the next 10 days, and that was Friday, um, that should help offset some of those folks who have been trying to apply or it says they've gotten rejected. It's just basically because the system hasn't been aligned with what the federal package has really drawn down. So. And, and by our understanding that, that as that application process is a little bit fluid, because as you mentioned, there are systems that are being changed really to, to, uh, to take on the, the new legislation and, and new priorities that are out there, that any uh, fees that someone may be due to them can be placed retroactively uh, Correct. if they qualify for COVID-19 um, uh, employment termination, that they can actually get benefited from Correct. that um, and, and that date will slide with them. Right. That's correct. Um, you know, you, I know you've got some experience at, at the federal level of government, too, in, in your career. I, I think it's interesting in looking at a time like this. Have you remembered a period in, in our lives where you have seen so much um, legislation turn into policy as quickly? And with that, um, understanding that there are challenges that come with that, but, but how do you feel like uh, thrown into this situation, some of those um, those those roadmaps, if you will, have worked out to try to to push the, the monumental volume of legislation that we've seen to try to help people to actually turn it into I can pick up a phone and talk to someone and, and get what I'm what I read in the newspaper yesterday is due to me. Yeah, I don't think on the federal level I can recall seeing anything that moved as swiftly in those packages that that moved over that course of that week last week. I was trying to think through that, and I, I don't recall ever seeing anything that aggressive. Um, and ambitious happen, happen so quickly, which, you know, there's a domino effect of that. And that is like the pressure then it puts on the states to actually implement or execute or disperse those dollar amounts too. Um, and then the amount of time it takes to actually get those dollars into the hands of the people that really do need those funds right now. Um, so I, I can't say that I, I've seen exactly kind of that scenario. As far as 
the response is concerned as a whole. I mean, we're clearly dealing with an un in an unusual time. It's a it's a different um, emergency situation, um, but it is fascinating to see how there are principles that you apply during um, a hurricane, for example, or you know any other sort of nat natural disaster scenario that those principles can apply to this in this setting too. And so I've been um, encouraged when I've seen just increased level of just emergency management, you know, at the state level, I will say that um, our North Carolina emergency management and our HHS have been like lock and step the entire time from the beginning. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been encouraged by that side of it. So we'll see what legislation on the state level um, will take place. Again, we're not, we're still scheduled to be in session at the end of April. And um, we're anxiously trying to figure out, <laughs> like everyone else, we've been watching the federal dollars too and the federal legislation and combing through that to ensure we understand kind of what, um, how we can complement that and how we can partner with that in order to really take care of, of, of our citizens. So that's something we, that's, that we're doing. We're trying to figure out, you know, and what measures to take place, whether it's in education or whether it's with unemployment. Um, or whether it's with the hospitality industry and a relief package there for those folks. Um, just because, I mean, we know that, you know, there's been at least a loss of, in restaurants, I think a loss of like 70% 70, 70 of the workforce, you know, and in and hotels, you're looking more closely at 28 to 30%. So uh, anything that we can do to really kind of get North Carolina back in business as quickly as possible, as I know something that the, um, I mean, balanced with, of course, protecting our citizens and, and their safety, we, we understand that, but at what point can we really, um, you know, look at how do we phase in sort of, you know, business again? Um, and I know that's something that our chamber in particular is really trying to look at too, so. Uh, as, as you look on the horizon now, the next week, two weeks, uh, certainly we're, we're looking for the, the health trends there and, and seeing exactly like you just mentioned, uh, what those trends say about the spread of the disease throughout North Carolina. What other things are on the horizon uh, of your colleagues in the Senate, but certainly the House as well, to look at as possible uh, actions by the state government to combat any of what we see here in these next few weeks? Oh, kind of what I just mentioned as well. I mean, we are looking at, you know, what relief packages can we put together um, specific to that? What can we do with the unemployment um, program on the state level that has a, has a, um, healthy reserve at this point, thanks to just the discipline of leadership that's taken place over the last 10 years in the chamber um, and in the General Assembly, but it's just, um, you know, how can we make modifications possibly to the length of those benefits? Or do we want to look at the amount of that? And, and how do we, you know, does it align with the federal? Or what do, what do we want to do exactly? So I know there's a lot of conversation going on on the unemployment side. Um, and in education, of course, we're looking at, um, you know, there's always talk of like the calendar and the school calendar. There's always talk of, you know, of what are we looking at as far as graduation requirements and waiving different testing and accountability measures for the schools and school performance report cards. So there's a lot of work being done in that. I, just this past week, I listened in on kind of the higher ed institutions. So you're looking at your community colleges, your independent universities, and then the UNC system kind of presenting some of their challenges and, and even funding requests that they have. Um, during this time. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, I mean, it's affecting everyone across every sector. So I'm anxious to see um, on the healthcare side of things, what we're going to be able to do um, and even furthering support, hopefully some of our county um, public health officials, you know, I've been keeping in touch with June Green and her team and all the work that those guys are doing in touch with the hospitals, um, understanding what our capacity is at, what do we need, where, where are we on PPE. So, just really um, making sure I understand the day-to-day -day and the realities of what we're facing so that we know how to really, you know, come back and, and support that and, you know, champion those efforts that have been done and those folks that have been putting themselves on the front lines. Last question I've got for you is a little bit of a crystal ball question. And, and I know that there is, it's probably not a right answer to this yet, but you mentioned broadband a little while ago. Do you feel like there is anything that has come of the last few weeks that may be that shiny thing that becomes the next big project for implementation? I mean, we, we saw so much change in, let's say, airport security after 9-11, and, and rightfully so, and we saw fundamental changes to how air travel worked. 
is there fundamental change to how we live that's come out of this that could be something as, as uh, simple as the, the kick in the pants that maybe broadband needs to, to become a state deployable asset? Uh, anything like that that you've seen thus far that, that maybe makes you think, let's put this on the shelf and come back to this at an appropriate time? Well, I definitely feel like the broadband needs and the inequities that lie across the state have, have definitely been more magnified during this scenario. So I'm optimistic and hopeful that even working with, you know, whether it's public-private partnerships with providers on how to how to close those gaps in those areas, um, you know, how we can move some of those conversations a little bit more, for, you know, further along than they have been. And I think uh, there's really, this is a, a key opportunity to do that. I've talked with several folks. I talked to a fo uh, some folks in Ash County this past week over um, kind of right there on that line too of deep gap um, and with Taga and look. So it's kind of like that, that little pocket yeah. and really trying to understand the needs there because they both are now working from home and their service is really spotty, um, but have maybe have issues and difficulties working with providers in the specific territories. So I'm really intrigued um, to how we can, can move that along. And it, what's interesting is I sit on uh, DIT's oversight committee and in February we had a meeting. And so I was able to address some of that directly by understanding, well, how can we, can we identify, for example, the homework gap? Can we really identify those areas like down to the streets and the homes um, in order for us to know how to really close the gap? You know, it's like I really need to understand what the gap is in order to close it. And so DIT was basically, they could get it down to almost a regional type level, but not, not drill down that far yet. So I think that is key. I think we really have to be targeted in how we wanna you know, respond and improve those inequities really across the board. I mean, the schools have done a really good job with providing you know, hotspots on buses that maybe need to go and sit in various areas or have made Wi-Fi accessible and available on different properties. Community colleges have done the same thing. But I mean, it is across each sector, and I've, I've brought this up too. I mean, it's really a digital infrastructure um, challenge that has, has made it really probably a little bit harder for us to pivot um, like we needed to have pivot um, a little bit quicker. But hey, I mean, this is great opportunity for us to recognize and just for us to continue to move forward in that area. And I think everyone should see this as, you know, our challenges right now and our concerns are really opportunities for us to know how we can improve upon this and keep moving forward. And I think that's, you know, we, we've got to remain positive and um, just optimistic about what's, what's coming and what the future of North Carolina is. Well, Senator Ballard, we appreciate, uh, as always, uh, your um, uh, abilities as, as our representative, but certainly um, your attentiveness to your constituents at this time and your accessibility. Um, uh, all of our, our leaders here, uh, yourself, uh, certainly uh, Representative Fox at the federal level, Ray Russell in the, in the House alongside you. Uh, you guys have answered questions. You've answered constituents uh, down to the individual asks, and that means a lot to a community that's got a lot of questions and a lot of concerns right now. So thank you for your leadership and, and we really enjoyed uh, catching up with you today and, and look forward to doing so again in the future. Well, thank you. And I, while I have the opportunity, I mean, I really would just like to thank um, everyone in the community that has stepped up. I mean, and really uh, spent their weekends. I know the days probably start to blur together for everybody um, and everyone's experiencing um, or, or grieving in a sense too, of just this timing and the, and the loss of timing and various ways and families and uh, you know I'm really proud though of of how folks have really stepped up and I think our community colleges have done that um, you know each each even institutions actually going through and providing like gloves and gowns and masks and you know using 3d printing to create the face shields um, so there's a lot of ingenuity that's taken place which I think you know again is just another example of using this as an opportunity to shine and to sh shine in our district and what resources we have available too. So um, I just think all of our bus drivers that are still working and that are getting those food and getting those packets out to those kids and just uh, a lot of that local leadership. I know everyone's been very coordinated and communicating with one another um, on that local level, which I think is key and super valuable. So I encourage folks in the community and um, throughout the towns and just throughout the counties, really just to understand that uh, you should be really proud of the leadership um, that is taking place and, and how important that is during these challenging times. So 